But if you are here this morning, you remember we've been talking from Psalm 136, and we said this, that if you don't know it, the Psalms are, are were the, the prayer book, the hymn book, and they still are, of, of Israel. That this is, uh, if, you, if you've been around in uh, church for a long time, you remember back in the day, right, you had your Bible and you had your hymn book, right? Anybody remember, remember that back in the day? Like we, and we've sort of moved away from that. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. But the, hymn, the, the Psalms would have been the hymn book of ancient Israel. And it's not just a song book. It's also a prayer book. It's also a book of poetry. In fact, we said this. It's so uh, influential in shaping their theology and their prayers that is Jesus as he's hanging on the cross dying. And he says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And on the surface, we sort of look at that and go, well, yeah, like he's, God's forsaken him. He's kind of crying out, but he's actually quoting directly, like verbatim from Psalm 22. So even Jesus in his dying moment, in the moment of his greatest crisis, he's pulling from the Psalms to pray. And we said this, that, that the Psalms are important, that we need to, as we gather together and we sing and we uh, pray, that, that, man, we pull from that, that that becomes a deep well that we pull from in our times and our moments of crisis. And we looked at this Psalm 136, and we said this, that, that it's reminding us of a few things. It would have been a psalm where the people in the temple, they would gather together and they would sing this together. And it would be almost like a responsive reading. And we're going to read the, the last half in a minute. But if you've ever been to a church where there's a responsive reading, right? The person up front will say a line and then the congregation will say a line. And we did that this morning. And the line is this, his faithful love endures forever. And what's interesting is the, the word there uh, in Hebrew that his faithful love is the same word that we read and in Lamentations, his steadfast love, that he, he's going to be a faithful God. And so, um, but we said a few things about this passage this morning. We said this, that we need to give thanks because God is in control and that God is good. Yes. And you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that reasons to despair, but we ought to remember, and it's good for us to come together and to remember that God is in control and that God is good. Then we said this, that we should also give thanks because this good God made a good world for you and me to enjoy. That when you look at creation, it ought to do something inside of you and point you towards the Creator. And this psalm, again, the first half of it is going to lay these ideas out. And then we ended this morning by saying this, we should give thanks because God has saved us. The psalmist, he's, what he does is he goes through this and he begins by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. He's the God of all gods. He's the Lord of all lords. He's in complete control. And he says, God made the heavens and he made the earth and he made the sea and he made the sun and the moon. And he made all these things. His love endures forever. And then he moves into Israel and he says, this is the God who delivered you from Egypt. This is the God who parted the Red Sea. His love endures forever. And, and he's saying that they're rehearsing and they're reminding themselves of all that God had done. And they, they're gathering together as a congregation and they're remembering these great and mighty things that God has done. And we said this, that we may not be, uh, have been delivered from literal sort of slavery in Egypt, but man, we've all been delivered from sin. That sin is slavery and it is bondage and that Jesus has made a way for us to be no longer slaves. We are not slaves any longer. We are free in Christ. That no longer are we to walk in darkness, but now we walk in light. And that we ought to remember this and give thanks for this. And this ought to make us, uh, it ought to do something for us. And we did say this, that when we come together, this idea of giving thanks, it's not just sort of like, uh, it's deeper than we think of it. It's almost this confession we make to one another. It's this declaration of how good God is and what He's done in our lives and the ways He's come through and the ways that He has been faithful. And so that's where we left off this morning with this idea that we should give thanks because God is good and He's in control. That we give thanks because this good God made a good world for us to enjoy and we give thanks because God has saved us. And so as we mentioned this morning, we're entering... Thanksgiving season, right? Next week is November 1st, and we talked some about how you'll see all over social media like 30-day Thanksgiving challenge, and people will be thankful for all of these things, and that we should be. But the Bible is going to remind us even more that we should be thankful, and this psalm is, again, in many ways, this reminder of what Israel and what we should be thankful for. 
And so I want to pick up where we left off this morning uh, because it's a lot to read. Uh, and then we're going to begin in verse 13. And here's what I want to do. Again, uh, you help me out. You don't have to stand, but I'll say the, a line and you say the li a line. And your line is this. The faithful love of the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. That's your line. His faithful love endures forever. So again, the responsive reading, it'll be on the screen. Verse 13. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His he led Israel safely through. But he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. He killed powerful kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance a special possession to his servant Israel. He remembered us in our weakness. He saved us from our enemies. He gives food to every living thing. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. Man, he is a good God. Yeah. And his faithful love endures forever. So let's pick back up where we left off this morning. So we said again that we are to give thanks because God is good. God is in control. That he created this good world and that he saved us. And now we're going to move on to saying this. We should give thanks because God has provided for and directed us. That the, the psalmist here is reminding the people of Israel that God did not just deliver them that he provided for them. You see, uh, it would be one thing for God to deliver them and then say, I've done my part, have a great day, right? And just lead them into the desert and sort of let them figure it out along the way. But the psalmist is reminding us that we don't serve a God who says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you saved. Great, now go do, go do your thing. And I, I'll let you do, you do it. I got nothing to do with it. No, he, he delivered them. And this psalm is going to remind us that he's also working ahead of them to prepare a place for them. Even, even down to the very timing of when they would be delivered and the land that they would go to and the route that they would take through the wilderness and the, the battles that they would face, God had mapped all of those things out and had made place for His people. He had led them through the wilderness and He had prepared this place for them that he had promised to them many, many, many years earlier to Abraham. That this God was going to be faithful. Even though they had been in slavery for over 400 years, God was working, God was moving, and God was uh, putting plan in motion on their behalf so that they could have everything they needed that he didn't just free them and sort of dump them on the side of the road, that he frees them because he's got a good plan for them and because he has, he's going to prepare a place for them. In Deuteronomy, we're reminded as these uh, Israelites are getting ready to enter the promised land that God has given them, Moses gives them some warnings. And in chapter 8, God reminds them to remember that he's the only one to provide for them. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 but this is Moses speaking on behalf of God. He said, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. Verse 12, when you become full and prosperous and you've built homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds become very large and your silver and gold, they multiply with everything else. Be careful. Don't become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Don't forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was hot and dry, that he gave you water from a rock, that he fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did it all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God 
He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant He confirmed with your ancestors with an oath. What is God saying? I am the one who's provided for you. I, I am the God who led you through the wilderness, who gave you food to eat, who gave you water to drink, who took care of you. I am the one when you get into this promised land and you build homes and you build houses and you uh, begin to, to have businesses and you begin to, to, to thrive. When you get there, remember this, I'm the one who made the way. I'm the one who prepared the way. I'm the one who uh, fought battles before you. I'm the one who removed kings and nations in front of you. I am the one who did all of this for you. That you did not get there on your own. And as they come into the congregation and as they sing this Psalm 136, they are reminded that it is God who went before them on behalf of them and worked to, to take out armies that they needed to be defeated, to deal with kings that needed to be uh, eradicated, to, to make space for them and to provide for them. Notice as we read this Psalm named several kings and nations that God moves out in order to give place to Israel. And God long before had promised this land to Abraham and to his descendants. And God was making good on that promise. It tells us also, God remembered them in their weakness and saved them from their enemies. Again, it's a reminder that, man, you and I and we don't have, what, like, we don't have it together. It's so tempting for us to think that we did it, that somehow we accomplished it. We, we have in... Uh, our vocabulary as Americans, right? This self-made man and self-made woman. But as Christians, there is no such thing as a self-made man or self-made woman. Like, whatever you have is a blessing and a gift from God. And it's all meant to be given back to Him in worship. And what this psalm is doing is this reminder that throughout their history, God has been faithful to them. Not only did He save them, did He lead them out of Egypt, but He also created and made space for them. And when their enemies came against them, God fought for them. God had given them an inheritance. He had already provided all of this for them. And the truth is that God has worked in your life and in my life to provide for us and direct us. God led you in ways that you often do not see. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you look around at your life and you go, how did I get here? And not in a, not in a negative way. You sort of go, wow, how, how, did I, how, did I, how did this happen? And when you begin to think about it, you begin to notice and you begin to retrace your steps and you begin to see how the Lord directed all along the way. That it was Him that provided. That it was Him that directed, the, directed you. That it was Him that opened the door. That it was Him that provided the job. That it was Him that took care of you. That it was Him that, that held you through all of the stuff that life threw at you. And you didn't think that you could make it. And you look back and you go, oh man, how, like, wow. God has been so good. He's, he's, been, he's been so amazing. Look at all the ways that He's come through for me. Look at all the ways that He's been faithful. When I didn't think that I was going to make it, when I didn't think there was enough money in the bank account, when I didn't think that that was going to come through, man, the faithful love of the Lord is endured forever. Okay? He has been so good. Recently in my, in my own life um, and in the life of my family, my, my wife is had some uh, decisions to make about some, some career moves that she's wanted to make for uh, quite some time. And uh, about a year ago, she had this opportunity that like, if you were looking at it on paper, you would be like, yeah, like you should, you should do that. Like that's, you better do that, right? Like she had this, this job offer, it was closer to home. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that came into play and like, yeah, like this, you need to do this. But as she was praying about it, she just said like something like, it looks good, but like something about it's just not right. And this is what she said. She said, I just feel like God's saying, just trust me. And so she trusted him and she didn't go that route. And looking back, it's been amazing over the past few weeks as God has just, some other doors have opened, whereas if she had, if she had taken that step, right, like she wouldn't be where she is now in order for those doors to open, right? And we've all had those moments where, we look back and we go, like, I, that didn't, that seemed like it wasn't the right thing to do necessarily, but like you could see and you could trace your steps how God has been faithful and He's all along the way been directing and He's been providing for us and He's been taking care of us and He's been working. And those are incredible moments when we look back and we realize, oh man, 
It's like, uh, it's like when you were a kid, right? And you, you grow and like you don't notice because you just, see your, like you just see yourself every day, but you've grown slowly, but somebody that hasn't seen you, and like an aunt or something, they haven't seen you in five or 10 years, and they're like, oh my word, like you got so big, and you're like, I, like I, I've always been this, like you, you kind of don't, you don't realize it, but other people notice, and there are times in your life where God's working, and he's directing, and you don't see it, and then one day, all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't notice that, because he was doing it so slowly. I didn't, I didn't notice that because he was working so, he was working behind the scenes. But, but wow, like, I'm, like God's really done something. He's been faithful. But like Israel, isn't it, it's always so easy to get comfortable. I mean, it's always easy to think, man, we, we got here. We did this on our own. It's often said, I, I used to go to, uh, when I went to Southeastern, one of the, the president of the, at the school when I graduated, at the time, he always had this like little spiel he would share at graduation, and he would always say this, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself, right? And it's true, right? Like you, we didn't, we did, you did not get here by yourself. Like it is the Lord's faithfulness. And this psalm is a reminder to the people of Israel, they did not do it all. God's the one who's been faithful. And this is why we come to worship every week. I know we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic, and, and even before that, there's a lot of questions about how important is it that we meet, that we gather. And, uh, and this, is no, this is no shade on people who, uh, for health reasons, like can't be here. We gather online. There's something there as well. Like there's nothing about that. But like our gathering is important. Yeah. Like when we connect with each other in a week, what it does is this is we come in together and we're reminding one another as we sing these songs. Listen, we don't sing these songs just to sing them, right? They're, 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 they're informing our, our theology. They're shaping the way that we view God. So you, you know, you remember songs better than you do almost anything else, right? It's easier to remember. And these songs are shaping and molding, just as the Psalms did, they're shaping and molding your way that you view God and how you see the world and how you see God and, and all of these things. And when we come together and sing these songs, man, it's reminding us of the faithfulness of God. And there's something about the habit of doing that on a regular basis that starts to form you and shape you. Like, I, I think that we forget that. Like, this is not just an exercise in futility. Like, we're doing this because, like, when you go to the gym and you do it consistently, right, and it builds muscle and the habit, and it starts to become a habit and it starts to transform you, when you begin to do things like show up at church and begin to declare and sing these songs and declare with each other the goodness of God, that He has blessed you even in hard times, that He's been faithful, that He's been good. Like, there's something about doing that on repeat week after week after week after week with the people of God that begins to form you and shape you and mold you. Because, listen, now more than ever, there is a world out there that has uh, new means and new ways to shape you more effectively than ever before. Like, social media and smartphones and cable news and all of the stuff that comes our way, it's fighting to shape your imagination. It's fighting to shape your mind. It's fighting to shape the way that you view the world. And for some people, sad to say, like they are more shaped by those things than they are by Jesus. But part of being shaped by Jesus is showing up week after week and sort of like, as, as you would say, if you're working out, is doing your reps, right? Showing up week after week and, and saying... I, I know that that's trying to form me, but that, I cannot, like, I've got to be formed by Jesus. And it is showing up and, and reminding ourselves as we sing these songs that we didn't get here on our own, that God has been faithful, that God has been good, that all along the journey, God has been with us. The discipline of coming to church every week and singing together isn't just to make you feel good and tingle. Like it's doing something to you, it's forming you, it's shaping you, and it's a weekly reminder and an acknowledgement that you didn't get here alone, that there's a faithful God, and there are people that are with you. And as we do this over and over again, it starts to work its way into our bones. And why is this important? Well, here's the thing. Like if you develop habits, right? Habits are things that you get good at to the point that you don't have to like think about them. You just autopilot, boom, like you just do them. So if you ever learned to play an instrument, right? You start out, uh, if you took piano lessons as a kid, maybe you start out and it's kind of clunky, right? You got to look at the page and you got to look at the notes and you got, like it's clunky. 
But eventually what happens is it becomes habit and it becomes muscle memory. And you don't even, you just, you don't even look. You don't, you don't have to do anything. You just look and you start to play. And what happens is this, is that when we, uh, when we develop habits, like attending church, like reading scripture, like uh, praying, like these habits, and we get them deep into our bones, we get them deep into who we are, it starts to form us and shape us, and we, it, start, it starts to just change us. And naturally, you see, when you hit a crisis, like the habits you've developed start to really show themselves. Yeah. Or, the, or the lack thereof, right? When you hit a crisis moment, like it, it, you get, you, you've heard of like fight or flight, right? Like you don't get to make a decision over what you do. Like your brain kicks into gear and you just do it. And when we hit a crisis, right, spiritually speaking, oftentimes like we're not thinking about what to do. Like our natural, whatever way we lean starts to take over. And if you have developed those habits and they're deep in you who you are, man, Jesus starts to come out. And you start, you start to move in the right direction. And if you do not, if you've been more formed by your social media, your cable news, your whatever, fill in the blank, whatever it is, like you will lean that direction instead of the direction Jesus wants you to. That, that is why, again, it's so important. Like gathering together, like we don't do it just for fun, like just because we, like, want, like it's, that's not, the, like it is fun, right? But that's not the point. Like it's doing something to shape you to form you. And I, I think we forget how important those habits are. Hebrews says it this, don't give up the habit of meeting together. And again, I know that's no, we're not throwing anything, any stones at people who have to stay home because they're sick. But we, there, we gather together online as well. Like that is, I, I think that God gave us those tools and we should use them. But man, we better gather. We better not just sit. We better gather together. We ought to be. There's something that forms and shapes us and reminds us of His faithfulness and His provision. And so we are thankful to God because He's good and because He's in control, because He created the world, because He saved us, because He's provided for us and He's delivered us and directing us. And then lastly tonight, this. We give thanks to the Lord simply because his faithful love endures forever. Yes. This psalm ends where it starts, right? If you remember when we started this psalm, the first few verses say that we give thanks to God for he is good. He's the God of gods and the Lord of lords. It, it's broadened and then it reminds us of creation and then it gets real specific on Israel and how he saved them and how he's delivered them and how he's provided for them. And then it's gonna, it's gonna sort of grow back out and broaden again and it reminds us, as he closes this psalm, it says this, that God gives food to every living thing. Yes. It says that he's the God of heaven. It broadens back out. So it, it starts big, and it moves in, and then it moves back out, like almost like a uh, picture breathing. It sort of starts big, and then it sort of moves in, and then it exhales back out. This psalm sort of does that. And... He closes with this idea that we serve this God who created the world, saved us, provided for us, who's given us the very food that we eat, and he's, he's been faithful to us. He's been a good God. His faithful love endures forever. And I would not do this passage justice if we did not hone in on this word, faithful love. I, I'm reading it from the New Living Translation on purpose because this word can be translated a whole bunch of different ways. Your, word, your, passage, uh, your translation might say the mercies of the Lord. Some translations say the steadfast love of the Lord. Some translations just say mercy. Some say uh, just love. But I love this wording, the faithful love of the Lord. This is one of the most important words in all of the Old Testament. It is this word uh, called uh, hesed. And it is... Uh, it can be translated love, but that doesn't do the word justice. Like, it's, it's hard to get over into English what it actually means, and that's why there's a broad range of interpretations. It's used some 240 times in the Old Testament, and it almost always refers to God, and it almost always refers to His love. And it's not love in the way that uh, we talk about in culture. It's not this flippant love, like, I love you, okay. Like, it's not, it's not that type of thing, or I love potato chips, or I love, 
I love barbecue or I love brisket, even though I do, right? Like it's not those flippant things. It is a powerful word. And one of the main uses of it is this, that God has made a covenant to his people and he's going to keep that promise. He's going to be faithful to that promise. It's deep love. It's this idea that God has made a promise and he's sticking to it. And think in terms of a marriage commitment, that God has made a covenant, he's made a promise to Israel, and like, he's like a bulldog on it. Like There is no way he's going to let that thing go. In marriage commitment, think about it, we say this, for better or worse, in sickness and in, till death do us part. It's a very similar idea that God's making a covenant with His people, and His people likewise are supposed to make the same covenant to Him, that we are faithful to each other to the bitter end of this thing. Come hell or high water, come whatever happens, we're together and we're moving forward together. That's the idea here. And sadly, what happens is on our part, we oftentimes fail. Like, we don't fulfill our end of the bargain. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the book of Lamentations, which we opened with tonight, the reason that they got into that place is because they failed to fulfill their end of the covenant. They were unfaithful. But notice what the text says to us. Despite their unfaithfulness, what is God? He's faithful. Despite their failure, God does not fail. Despite the way that they broke his covenant, God doesn't break his end of the bargain. That his faithful love endures forever. And it's this love that calls us to respond, to love him just as faithfully as he loves us. It's this idea that God is going to be faithful and love faithfully forever. That there is, and this is. This is tied again to the very character and nature of God. This is not just saying God loves. It is God is love. It's not just saying God does loving things. It's the very character, the very essence of who he is, is this faithful, never ending, never giving up, never giving in love for you and for me. And he created, he saved, and he provided for. Why? Because of his great and unfailing love. Why do we say, after every line in this this song, right? They say it, his faithful love endures forever. Why? Because he's doing all of those things. Saving, delivering, uh, providing, being good to them, overcoming their enemies, creating the world. What is all that coming out of? His faithful love that endures forever. His faithful love. It, it is part of who God is. Let me tell you this. When I was a, when I was a kid, and maybe I, I wrongly thought, and, and this is a, sometimes a popular belief, like why did, God, why did God create human beings in the first place? And I often thought, well, I guess maybe God was lonely, needed somebody to talk to, so he creates. Like, no. No. God's not lonely. God's not missing anything. He's complete in himself. That even before the beginning of time, before there was anything else to love, God lives in Trinity, in relationship to himself, in perfect love. Why does he create? When you love something and someone, like you want to share it, like you want to give it, like you want to spread it out. And, And he creates out of an overflow of his own love, that he works in our lives out of an overflow of his own complete love. He's complete within himself. Like, he doesn't need anyone to complete him. Father, Son, and Spirit existed before time began, all together, and they will exist forever in eternity, together, in in this loving and perfect relationship. And everything that happens is an overflow and an outflow of that deep love. So why does God create? Simply because creating is part of who He is, because He loves and He wants to give. He wants to give of Himself. He wants wants to share. He wants to to bring more people into, into the fold. He wants to bring more people into that deep, loving relationship because He is whole and complete, and He wants you and me to be whole and complete. And so He loves, and He creates, and He gives, and He gives, and He's faithful, and He's loving. Why? Because that's who He is. It's who he is. 
And I, again, I, there's a big difference. And we get them confused sometimes. You think God is loving. Like, no, yes, God is loving, but He's loving because He is love. And He's been love from, the, from before the beginning of time. He has been love. And He will be love for, the, for all of eternity. And He will be good for all of eternity. And He will be faithful for all of eternity because this is who He is. It's His very essence. And so he's created and saved us and, and provided for us. And how do we know? This is the question that the New Testament's going to answer. How do we know that God loves us? The New Testament's going to point us to Jesus. We can all quote it, John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Paul reminds us in Romans 5, 8, God showed his great Love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. John in 1 John is going to remind us we know what real love is. Why? Because Jesus gave up his life for us. In other words, Jesus is the picture and the reminder that his faithful love endures forever. Like if you want a picture of what that love looks like, you look at Jesus. You look at Jesus. In fact, in Colossians, we get this, Colossians 1.15, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, that He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. What's that saying? If you want to know who God is, you look at Jesus. If you want a picture of what God is up to and what God is like, you look to Jesus. The author of Hebrews is going to tell us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, He's spoken to us through who? His Son. What's He saying there? If you want to know what God is saying, look to Jesus. And what's God saying? His faithful love endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. Jesus is a reminder that God keeps His promises and that His faithful love endures forever. This is probably uh, uh, maybe a crude illustration, but I think it gets the point. If you've, if you've got kids, right? Uh, mine, uh, as they were, they were born and as they get older, everybody tries to figure out, like, which one looks like who. Like, like, like so... There's no denying that my daughter looks like my wife, and then everyone's kind of like trying to figure out my son. Like some people are like, yeah, he looks like you. Other people are kind of like, no. And interestingly, as you get older, right, you start to look more and more like your parents. Like, like it or not, that's just the way that it is. And we came across this uh, interesting thing the other day. My wife and my mother-in-law, right? You guys, if you have a, a, one of those Apple phones that like reads your face, like, as, as they've aged and gotten older, right, my wife and my mother-in-law, they can unlock each other's phones because their faces, their faces look so similar, all right? And, and that, that's interesting, but here's the, here's the point, is that, man, if you want to know who God is, if you want to unlock who God is, you have to do nothing but look at the face of Jesus, that He is the perfect representation of the Father, that he's the perfect representation of who God is. And who is God? He's faithful. He loves you. His faithful love endures forever. Amen. So I don't know, again, what you may have come into this room with tonight, but we read it at the beginning of the Lamentations text. And here's Jeremiah. He's been through all of this stuff. And you know, I, I can't help but wonder, as he pens those words in Lamentations 3, and he says, great is thy faithfulness. I can't help but wonder if, it, if he pulls that language because one day as a kid, he's in the temple, right? And they're singing their songs and they go to Psalm 136 and he's singing and he's echoing as part of the congregation and they say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And he sings out, his faithful love endures forever. And if in the moment where he's crying and weeping over Jerusalem and he is struggling because it's gotten so bad and he's tried to warn the people and they failed to listen. And he's just had it and he's just over all of it. And he's in that moment and he's praying and he's in despair and he's ready to throw in the towel. And something from his childhood in the back of his mind just begins to play. And he remembers sitting in that congregation, singing that song, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. 
And as he's weeping and crying and as he's pinning this, he, remember, he begins to write, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The faithful love of the Lord is always there. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new every single morning. And I just want us this evening just to be reminded that God is faithful and that God is good. And wherever it is you find yourself in, man, his faithful love endures forever.